live from Des Moines. It's a random weeknight. In this episode, animation, a species spotlight, digital painting, fly tying, and walk cooking. We better get started. I conceived a plan to hide my bad animation by bringing the file into After Effects and applying a, an adjustment layer with a turbulent displace. And then I just resized the adjustment layer so that only this part of the image would uh, have the turbulent displace. So it's got fairly small uh, size and amount. And we've got the just plain old uh, turbulent. And we're doing a little bit of the evolution too. We got a couple rotations in on that. But the horizontal displacement is where the magic is happening. We've got a positive 2000 there at the beginning. And 20 seconds in, we've got a negative 2000. So that's what's giving that appearance of current. But I've built swim cycles for a couple different fishes and dolphins and so forth in Blender. I can tell you pretty much in the same amount of time or less I could build rig and animate a 3D model that would have a much better looking result in the end. I wouldn't need to hide it with a, by applying a turbulent displace in, in the same amount of time or less. So. I don't know, this frame by frame animation and, and uh, you know, a, a model is so much more versatile if, you know, if I want to use it again, it's ready to get already rigged and ready to go, whereas with frame by frame, I've got to start all over. Our species spotlight is another bolete mushroom, Tylopolis rubrobrunius this time. This is a mushroom that I had misidentified with Tylopolis batiseps for years because of the confirmation bias. I think subconsciously I wanted to believe that there was an easy way to distinguish the Tylopolis in this area. And I sort of settled on this idea somehow that the mushrooms I was seeing with dark stems were batiseps and the ones I was seeing with light stems were rubrobrunius. And somehow my brain, you know, began paying attention to evidence that supported that proposition and, and ignoring evidence that uh, contradicted it. That's just how that confirmation bias works. It can be very deceptive. But the truth of the matter is that the stems of Tylopolis rubrobrunius darken as they age and the caps lighten. I wanted to believe that things were simpler than they really are. So I wasn't paying attention to the full staining reaction and I wasn't tasting the mushroom. But finally, of course, I began to wonder why did I always see rubrobrunius in the early stages and why did I always see batiseps in the mature stages, well, the fact of the matter is that it was all the same mushroom, it was all rubrobrunius. The appearance of this mushroom just changes as it grows. The caps get lighter and the stems get darker. I finally did take the time to observe the staining reaction and took the time to taste a little bit of the mushroom. When I say taste, uh, this is a field test that mycologists use. You just chew a little bit of the mushroom cap and then spit it out. You're trying to detect compounds that you can't smell. And it had a bitter taste, which batiseps does not have. So I realized then that I'd been dealing with rubrobrunius all along. So in our last fly tying segment, we tied a couple of clouser minnow variations. The thing about the clouser and any fly where you have a long fiber material that's tied in only at one point and the other end of the material is free to flow around and so forth is that uh, that can change shape in an unnatural way as the fly sinks those fibers those loose ends of the fibers are drawn upward and then when the fly is stripped that all kind of draws together you know causing the body of the fly, the overall profile of the fly, to change shape in an unnatural way. It, if, imagine if you were if you were about to take a bite of a, of a hamburger and suddenly it changed shape into a hot dog. <laughs> you would 
you would throw that hamburger down so fast and step away and, and try to figure out what sort of alien technology made that change shape before it right, right as you're trying to take a bite of it. So have you ever had a fish rush up to your fly but turn away at the last minute without biting it? Probably some sort of, uh, you know, it, it did something that didn't appear natural. So this fly, because the fibers are attached along the entire length of the shank, does not change shape no matter what the fly is doing. Or you're just using a craft fur strip pulled down along the back. And we've got a big uh, juicy dubbing loop for the belly. Now if, uh, if we have a little trouble hooking fish, we can pull a few of those fibers out of the dubbing loop in the field. But now this fly would not be a good fly um, for micro skagit gear because it has that craft fur back. But this one would be one if we're switching to feathers, but it's tied the same way, and that would be one that could be cast with micro skagit gear. Uh, we're not using a wire rib on that. I'm just uh, wrapping the dubbing loop through the feather. Once it's wet and everything, it you won't be able to, you wouldn't be able to notice the difference between that and one with a wire rib so so on to our digital painting i had decided that the top of a fence post would not be wide enough for a cat to sit on it in the way that I had originally sketched. So I've redrawn the cat in a crouching pose. Now it's it's difficult enough for me to draw a human and ha you know get the uh, and get the anatomical proportions correct. But the anatomy of cats is a whole other level. So, but I think I've got it pretty close here. We'll just resize it a little bit. And now basically this is just going to be what would have been called uh, at another time the underpainting. We're going to just be blocking in some basic colors and shapes and throwing down some shading on them. And very little of this would actually be visible in the final, uh, in the finished form of the painting. But this mostly serves a, a placeholder kind of function to just define where light and shadow will be following on the objects. So we're just throwing down some basic underpainting type colors here. And I decided, I made a little mistake here, I should have gone ahead and there, you know, there are variations uh, in the color of this fur. I should have gone ahead and done that first. But I wanted to get some shading down. And the subjects are partially backlit. So that is, we're going to have some uh, specular highlights, uh, the, some transmitted light coming through in certain places. But for the most part here, we're just laying down some, some placeholders to define the flow of light and shadow. And we're just slapping down a little shading. This will be, like I mentioned, smoothed out and brushed over later on. So now I've appended a custom brush. Then we're going to try to make uh, this fur look like fur. That will build a texture to it that. Uh, will read as fur. So that will be quite a process. We'll uh, go ahead and skip on into the cooking segment. Uh, 
We're going to make several dishes here. One of them is going to be some bone broth. So we're getting our bones in the pot. Get that on the stove. We're going to do a stir fry with some bamboo. Now one of my co-workers uh, let me in on the secret to using this fermented bamboo, and that's to pre-boil it. And now we're going to add a little uh, Chinese black vinegar to our bone broth. The acidity from that is just going to help break down the collagen and so forth on the bones. Uh, after the bamboo par is parboiled, we're going to pull that out, chopping up some uh, galangal here. I've went ahead just to familiarize you with some of these names and so forth. Remember uh, Xanthoxylum americanum we did a feature on in an earlier episode. So this is a, uh, a similar plant. It's just native to Asia instead of uh, being the one that's a native uh, to the U.S. <clears throat> but yes, yeah, so I've uh, went ahead and looked up all the Latin binomials for, for some of these plants just to, you know, get you familiarized with uh, some of these names that we can be throwing around in later episodes. Um, you know, and, and to uh, give you the idea that this doesn't just come out of left field. These are plants and stuff, plant families that, that, that we use and eat every day. So that will be the aromatic mix for our stir fry. We're going to put some onions in there, some bamboo for our veggie mix. And uh, our little tub of uh, aromatics for the bone broth is getting to be a little bit full. The Chinese celery has a little bit stronger taste than your garden variety celery. And uh, that might have been a little too much. I kind of had a celery taste to the broth. That was fine. So we're going to soak this meat. This is a recipe that came from a YouTube channel called Made with Lao, which is a Chinese cooking channel. Worth checking out. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, I had a little trouble with the bonfa. Uh, but uh, I managed to get a usable amount of noodles out of it. And we're mixing up a sauce here. Um, you can find this sauce, the recipe for it, on that Made with Lao YouTube channel. Uh, so this is Gai Lan, uh, which is in the Brassicacia. And uh, we'll, you can see how broccoli-like it is. Although it's a, it's a Chinese vegetable. All right, so let's fire up the walk. Get, get a little bit good at that walk toss. Get a little good. That was the noodles right there. Uh, I think I figured out that I need to take the walk off the flame to add something to it. Because when I do, it causes a splash of oil, and that's when I get a flare-up. So I think I'll, if I remember to, I'll, I'll try that next time. Take the, take it off the, the cooker and then add it add, before adding the ingredients. So there's uh, one heat of the uh, beef and veggie mix. And in goes the guy Lan. Now I went a little crazy with the sauce and there was so much steam coming off that I couldn't see exactly what was happening. Uh, so it got a little too saucy and I didn't cook it all the way down to thicken it the way I should have. But I, it turned out alright. So there's the input the the ingredients going in and here's the two dishes the output that uh, or the result so there's the noodles underneath that uh, the beef and vegetable mixture and then over on the other side we got the guy line. and you can see it's a little it's a little saucy but it turned out all right so this is another dish we got a little of our bone broth throwing in a little soy sauce uh, this on the left is a amaranth in the family Amaranthaceae, and you can see that it has that same sort of uh, flower head. And so this would be the same family that beets and spinach and so forth, um, Swiss chard and so forth are part of. Um, so the other plant is uh, an edible chrysanthemum that's, of course, in the Asteracea family. So that would be the same as like lettuce and uh, sunflowers and so forth would be part of that family, the composite flower family. Uh, so you can see the red, that's the, the beta line pigments that I've bleached out of that uh, amaranthacea, that red amaranth. 
So these greens are ready to serve.